<clears throat> the word underrated gets tossed around a little too much these days, so I'm not going to use it to describe the 2002 film Lilo and Stitch, since it was obviously popular. It had its own ride in Disney World, three direct-to-DVD sequels, became the vehicle for millions in merchandise revenue, for good reason, Stitch is cute as hell, and had a few spin-off shows including an anime. <laughs> They're even planning a Disney Plus release of a live-action version. But still, these days I don't think the film gets the recognition it deserves as one of the best Disney movies ever made. The plot feels wholly original and well-paced, with a cohesive mix of feel-good themes like learned kindness, self-acceptance, found families. The artwork includes stunning watercolor backgrounds, a style not seen since Dumbo in the 40s. The music, sung by a Hawaiian children's choir, still gives me goosebumps at the start of the opening number. Even the marketing campaign for the film was pretty unique, with commercials featuring iconic Disney Renaissance scenes being interrupted by Stitch's chaotic antics. So perhaps my favorite thing about Lilo and Stitch has got to be just how weird it is. My friends need to be punished. And it's embrace of weirdness and the differences that make our lives interesting. The premise of the film is wild, but the heart of it is simple. So in this video, I want to take a closer look at what makes this film so unique and memorable. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, June's Journey. I grew up playing hidden object games and always found them to be really comforting and satisfying. Now I find it's a great way to relax while still engaging my brain with lightly challenging fun. June's Journey is a free-to-download mobile game that takes you back in time to play as a 1920s detective named June Parker. As you search through various scenes for clues and unravel the mystery behind her sister's puzzling death, it's a narratively driven game and the murder mystery aspect is not only intriguing but makes you feel you're working towards something and have goals to keep in mind. The game is split into chapters, each ending in a unique task that unlocks more clues, and the hidden object scenes get progressively more complex when you replay them, especially because I'm a bit of a perfectionist so I try to reach 5 stars in all of them. There are also hundreds of items and collectibles to unlock along the way as you decorate and expand your vast estate. I gotta say, I got pretty hooked during the first chapter and I'm looking forward to seeing how the story continues to unfold. Download June's Journey for free with the link in the description, and good luck solving the mystery. Now now on to the video. The great thing about the reviews that we had, they almost all cited that this was a very odd film. It was a very unusual film, which is what we were really going for. We wanted to make a film that was purposely, in a sense, odd, that was unpredictable that wouldn't fit nicely into any sort of pigeonhole that you might think of. Rather than releasing an adaptation, remake, or reboot, Disney took a chance with Lilo and Stitch's completely original premise. At the time, the company seemed more willing to take a risk and tell a smaller scale story. And in that session, we talked about the styles of movies. And one idea grew out of it, that what could be the Dumbo for our generation, meaning what could be a smaller movie that comes out as a real expression of an artist that is uh, both simpler from a production value point of view, but no less simple um, or heartfelt than any of the big movies. They also wanted to make something less expensive in the wake of the huge Disney Renaissance films of the 90s, like what they did in the 40s with Dumbo, which was produced after big budget films Pinocchio and Fantasia. I know Lilo and Stitch's screenplay evolved a lot from first draft to final, but just imagine pitching this story to the studio. A destructive, lab-grown alien escapes from captivity and finds its way to Earth, gradually learns about kindness and kinship by making friends with a lonely Hawaiian girl whose older sister is struggling to prove herself to a mysterious social worker, all the while the alien's mad scientist creator is hunting him down with the help of a government-employed mosquito advocate, but in the end the alien gets to stay on Earth via a minor legal loophole and they all end up in a loving, supportive family unit. This film is truly all over the place in the best possible way, and I honestly doubt it would get made if someone had pitched it today instead of 20 plus years ago. And again, similar to Dumbo, Lilo and Stitch features titular characters who feel isolated and excluded because of their weirdness. This is the driving force for change in the movie, but maybe not in the ways you'd expect. So to further emphasize this point, I'd like to examine the three main characters of the film. 
Lilo gets compared a lot to 2016's Hawaiian Disney princess Moana, but I think Lilo stands out as a character in a really distinct way we haven't seen before or since. We've watched the rise of quirky Disney princesses, characters marked by their dorkiness and lovable clumsiness. But Lilo's characterization wasn't quite as endearing to the people around her. From the very start of Hawaii's introduction as a setting, we're given a glimpse of Lilo's eccentricities. Soon after we see a fish wiggling by mysteriously clutching a sandwich, we learn that Lilo gives it a peanut butter sandwich every Thursday as a ritual of sorts. Lilo, why is this so important? Pudge controls the weather. You're crazy. From this initial scene, we gather that Lilo is viewed as an outcast by her peers and even adults. She has bizarre interests and often even stranger explanations for them. But her head is too big. So I pretend to bug laid eggs in her ears. Lilo's personality is partially impacted by external forces. In classic Disney fashion, her parents tragically died, leaving her in the care of her older sister. It can be argued that the reason Lilo felt the need to appease a weather-controlling fish is because her parents died on a stormy night. She was now in what she described as a broken family, small and disjointed. She acted out in response to her grief and rejection. She felt alone and misunderstood, and remorse about her impulsive reactions that drove people away. I'm sorry I bit you and pulled your hair and punched you in the face. A minor detail I've always remembered is the painting on the easel in her room. No! That's from my blue period! This went over my head when I watched the movie as a kid, but it really hints at the emotional turmoil Lilo endured. The Blue Period is a reference to Pablo Picasso's Blue Period. It was a time in his career marked by depression and grief, featuring paintings depicting society's loneliest outcasts in hues of blue and green. You can see on Lilo's easel that she painted her own version of the old guitarist, arguably the most famous and recognizable of Picasso's works from this era of his career. So not only was she familiar with Picasso, but she emulated him in order to express her deepest melancholic emotions. You know, you wreck everything you touch. Why not try and make something for a change? I think it's a pretty underrated reference and nod to Lilo's complexity as a character. It was an outlet for her to express herself in a way that she couldn't to other people. Another under-acknowledged facet of Lilo's isolating experience is the fact that she's a native Hawaiian girl in a place that caters to tourists who exotify her. This is why she takes those random photos of vacationers. It's like an exercise in countering the dehumanization she feels when they treat her like a prop or zoo attraction. Hey, speak English? Which way to the beach? Oh look, a real native! Isn't that cute? Her experience is further explored in this deleted scene where tourists casually make racist remarks towards her. She ends up exerting her own form of revenge by playing a prank on them. Are they still testing the sirens today? Oh we any minute now. Good. Tourists, prepare to die! Huh? It's a shame the scene didn't make it in the final cut, since from what I've read, it rings true to the experiences of native Hawaiians. If you lived here, you'd understand. On that note, I appreciate that the writers and artists of the film took the time to try to respectfully depict the lives and community of local Hawaiians. The cityscape didn't appear overly romanticized or spotless, and it showcased a real community-driven atmosphere. The characters' faces and bodies, particularly the women, were unlike any other Disney main characters I'd seen before, with thick legs and wide noses. And the Hawaiian voice actors for Nani and David rewrote portions of the script to accurately reflect Hawaiian slang and colloquialism. None of this may seem like a big deal now, but it meant a lot 20 years ago. Anyhow, plenty of factors contribute to Lilo feeling like the odd one out. Leave me alone to die. She's the weird girl, the black sheep. And for most of the people in her life, it's not in the quirky way that comes off as charming and funny. It's in the way that made her feel shunned. People treat me different. They just don't know what to say. So, this isn't a confirmed trait, but many fans of the film who are on the autistic spectrum say they saw themselves in Lilo. Her unique fixations, trouble expressing her feelings to other people, and difficulty making friends because of her perceived peculiarity all fall in line with the experiences of autistic people. Her particular way of interacting with the world and the people in it really seemed to resonate with them. You could call it accidental representation, but in any case, her characterization seems to mean a lot to people. So I don't think it matters whether she carries the label or not. 
Thankfully, Lilo had a guardian who accepted her for who she was. Nani is such an underrated Disney heroine. Like, forget Anna and Elsa. Nani and Lilo have the prime sister relationship. Nani didn't necessarily understand all of Lilo's quirks or special interests, but she didn't judge her or try to dissuade her from pursuing them. She developed the weird tourist photos for her. She played along with her harmless shenanigans, and she advocated for Lilo when other adults tried to shut her down. His name is Ditch. Oh, now that's not a real name in Iceland, but here it's a good name. One thing I notice is that she tries to explain things in ways Lilo can understand. Something sturdy, you know? Like a lobster. Lilo, you Lolo, do we have a lobster door? No, we have a dog door. We are getting a dog. She didn't say it's weird to want a lobster or that a lobster isn't a real pet. She brought up a practical explanation that they have a dog door, so that means they have to get a dog. It's such a simplistic yet effective way to communicate ideas to a child that doesn't belittle or dismiss them. And when Nani lost her job, which was definitely Lilo and Stitch's fault, she chose not to put that on Lilo's shoulders. Did you lose your job because of Stitch and me? Nah, the manager's a vampire and he wanted me to join his legion of the undead. Nani also put her own life on hold to care for Lilo, like putting off dating David, and as fans have pointed out, she has several surfing medals and trophies in her room, insinuating that she potentially gave up an athletic career. Despite her struggles, financially, socially, and emotionally, she does her best to give her sister a fulfilling childhood, all the while fighting to keep custody of her. Their relationship isn't perfect, as they often butt heads like plenty of siblings do. And Nani isn't exactly a full-fledged grown-up yet, however hard she's trying to be. But ultimately, it's a relationship steeped in acceptance and support, an environment that a kid like Lilo especially needs. I'm the only one who understands her. You take that away, she won't stand a chance. It's apparent that Lilo harbors guilt for her seemingly uncontrollable outbursts and wants to be a better sister. So their dynamic speaks to Lilo's desire for change, not for the sake of simply fitting in, because Nani ultimately supports her differences, but to change certain behaviors for the betterment of their relationship. Still, a loving guardian isn't typically a satisfactory stand-in for a friend, especially for a child. I need someone to be my friend. Someone who won't run away. Hi. Oh, how? Wow. Stitch's character is an extension of Lilo's. It's why she picks him out of all the other dogs in the shelter. She recognized his strangeness and was drawn to the fact that nobody else wanted him. Does it have to be this dog? Yes, he's good. I can tell. Like Lilo, he acted out in response to rejection, felt alone and misunderstood, and eventually felt remorse for his impulsive reactions. Stitch is an orphan in his own right, and Lilo herself essentially acknowledged their mirrored experiences. I know that's why you wreck things and push me. Stitch also sensed that he was the odd one out, like there's nowhere he belonged because he was screwing up Lilo and Nani's chances of staying together. Which is why towards the end, he left Lilo behind to search for his own family. He connected with the ugly duckling character in the classic fairy tale, who didn't fit in with the other ducks and seemingly had no family. Lost. The essential difference between Stitch and Lilo is he was created in a lab by a mad scientist and didn't have any prior relationships or connections to speak of. What must it be like to have nothing, not even memories to visit in the middle of the night? There was something deeply saddening about this to me. I think back to Frankenstein's monster from Mary Shelley's novel. The monster sought to fit in with humankind before being driven away and ultimately seeking revenge. There's a saying that goes, knowledge is knowing Frankenstein isn't the monster. Wisdom is knowing Frankenstein is the monster. In other words, the scientist Victor Frankenstein is the true villain of this story. He simply wanted to exploit nature without consideration for consequences. If we know anything about nature versus nurture, we know that real-life monsters aren't typically created, but more often shaped by their circumstances. Frankenstein's monster is a product of his environment, cast aside by the only person that could potentially understand him, and vilified by society for things outside of his control. I made you. You're built to destroy. You can never belong. What saved Stitch from a similar fate was the nurturing circumstances he found himself in. Dad said Ohana means family. Huh? It seems Lilo learned from Nani's patience and understanding as she mentored and trained her new dog Stitch. 
This is your badness level. It's unusually high for someone your size. We have to fix that. Through teaching Stitch and accepting him for his faults, she's learning alongside him and processing her own struggles. With time, he recognized that what he wanted, rather than citywide destruction, was to feel like he belonged, to the point where he risked venturing into the ocean just to do something fun with Lilo's family. It's important to note that Lilo and Stitch aren't trying to fundamentally change themselves, but rather the ways they communicate and get along with the people they care about. One of the original ideas in the very first book, the very first treatment, was the notion that when Stitch comes to fall in love with the idea of family and Lilo, that when he goes to rescue her, he's not a better person, he just has understood family. This is my family. It's little and broken, but still good. Through their hardships and triumphs, we see that kindness can be learned and families can be forged. I've discussed found families in a previous video, but in Lilo and Stitch, we get an unexpected and bizarre mix of characters who manage to establish a familial bond. Of course, we have Lilo, Nani, David, and Stitch, but by the end of the film, the family also includes Jumba, Pleakley, and the well-meaning social worker Cobra Bubbles. I think all of these characters can be considered outcasts in some form or another, and through this connection, they piece together their own funky little family, all while holding on to the mantra centered around Ohana. Ohana means family. Family means nobody, nobody gets left behind or forgotten. It doesn't matter if you're blood related. It doesn't matter if you're actually family. It's like you can have a group of friends and that would be your Ohana. Ohana can be whatever you make it. We create our family in many different ways. Somehow if you stick together and you love each other enough and you believe in each other enough, Love will prevail, family will prevail. I feel like this film, however universally loved, particularly spoke to the black sheep, people who've had their own struggles with feeling weird or unaccepted, who've perhaps had to assemble their own families from scratch, or have yet to discover the people they can connect to and feel comfortable with. And I think everyone has experienced the feeling of being an outsider at some point. And what we ultimately want from people is to feel seen. So I still appreciate this film for the way it normalizes odd families and divergent personalities, and encourages the notion that we all have the capacity to connect to other people. We just need to find the right ones. Hey y'all, hope you enjoyed the video and reminiscing on this movie with me. Let me know if Lilo and Stitch is particularly special to you or if there's some other film that does that for you. And remember to click that link in the description to download June's Journey for free and get started solving that murder mystery. I'll see y'all next time. Bye!